What's up guys? This is Pete with Renee and the topic of this video is called the symbolism of everything. Um, what was normal to our ancestors is now abnormal. Um, to get an understanding of how our ancestors viewed society, in a sense, you have to take a trip back through time. And in a sense, um, having an understanding of plants was critical to our ancestors because it gave them an uh, insight. Um, now, it gave them an understanding in how um, an understanding of the third eye, uh, trance, uh, vision, um, and also in how they guided their community. Now, I know uh, Renee wanted to, to add his take on this. Yeah, um, the 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 shapes that that, that they use they, when they go into this trance, you can. The, uh, one of the things that they would see are like um, spirals and triangles and squares and circles. This is very interesting shapes because they um, actually are common amongst all the cultures. You know, because um, the square, triangle, and, and the circle, those are the three shapes that can fit perfectly in a circle. You know, so it makes sense. For people see these things. There's other shapes too, but these are the main ones that usually see. Um, so the spirals are representing are of, to me, is, uh, according to my research, the spiral represents creation. This is where you get the spiral. Because everything is, uh, actually, this is how universe, universally speaking, the universe is created by using spirals. Our fingerprints have spirals. So it makes sense how uh, the, these um, recordings of uh, especially the hieroglyphics use a lot of spirals. You know, you see these common amongst other cultures. Um, the triangle is another one, but that's another topic I don't want to get into. But these are the main symbolism they use. They will use um, Atabe, right? They use some type of symbols. And you can see in Atabe, I think Atabe has a spiral on her belly button, right? Was it? Yeah, circle and a dot. Circle and a dot. Yes, circle and a dot. So you can see it's the symbol creation. You know what I mean? Uh, the spiral is just a just a combination between masculine and feminine aspect, because uh, universally that's how the universe works. It uses masculine and feminine principles. But the spiral is just the the circle, which is women, because women are uh, feminine. I'm sorry, feminine because feminine is emotionally uh, are specific, emotionally very um, grasp, and masculine is mostly the straight line. So when these two come together, it creates a uh, spiral creation which creates uh life so this is how life works this is the creation the circle of life or the cycle of life uh everything works in spirals and that's specifically in circles anyways but these are the symbols that they use amongst uh in other cultures um i think there's other symbols that they use in taino uh, and other south american um, stuff one of them is um i think it's certain animals right they use certain animals or frogs Cookies. The frogs, another one, frogs are depicted of creation too, you know, the serpent. Serpent is the uh, the most common symbol amongst all native cultures. And the serpent is very common because the, cur the serpent is the symbol of visions, you know. And this is why when you're in trances, you see the serpent, you know. And the serpent is the vision of the Kodani. It is the vision of the third eye, as I mentioned before. It is the, it is the symbol of consciousness. It is the symbol of enlightenment. So um, the serpent or gives the vision like snake, you know what I mean? And that's what a serpent is. And this is why most cultures, um, when they are in trances, they see serpents, you know? Um, you see this all the time, so. But yeah, that, that's just my, um, as I said before, I think as you said, that was a great quote. Um, what was unnormal to the ancestors back then is now abnormal now, or normal. Now, that's because now we're becoming more open-minded to these things now, you know, and uh, we understand them now, you know. And symbolism is the language of consciousness, and we have to understand those symbolisms in order to understand what consciousness is, you know. And if you understand that, I think we will know where we're going. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. I think what's the great thing about coming out with this idea, the symbolism of everything, by the way, of uh, Renee came out with this title, this name, and when I heard him say that, we were having a conversation, you know, I think that was very cool, because in uh, putting together uh, 
systematically through the symbolism of philosophy, uh, language, and theology, when it concerns um, this world view of our ancestors, you know, we can be able to picture in our minds and how they perceive life. So, you know, sit back and enjoy uh, this interesting topic, and we hope that uh, this discussion that we have uh, opens up your mind uh, to research uh, a little deeper into the subject. Another thing is, uh, I think you stopped, did you stop? No, right? Now, keep going. So one of the things, all right, cool, I always want to put out that the symbolism they also use, they use symbols that have to do with nature, because they were, you know, the Indians or the people back then were nature worshippers. So they used symbols that depicted the sun. They were using symbols that depicted the, um, the moon. So they were using in colors to depict certain objects in the skies. The, the, the gold or the wanin is a symbol of the sun. The silver is a symbol of the moon. You know, red or whatever it is is a symbol of mercury. So anything of those type of colors, they would use colors, they would use shapes, they would use drawings. All of these, even rainbow with the feathers. The feathers are very, very um, important symbol. It was word in the head it has to do with consciousness. It also depicts the sun, enlightenment. Sometimes the rainbow. This is why they wear the feathers. You know, so they were very nature worshippers. They paid attention. See, we live now in the fast life. We're not paying attention. We don't really go out much because uh, we, we, you know, we want we live in that one track mind. We have to really pay attention to nature and how it works. These people were aware and right now we live in a modern society where we are unaware and I think that we have to pay attention now and that's what's missing. That's cool. So with that, let's get into the conversation. Uh, we hope you enjoy. All right, what's up, guys? Um, we're going to get into the historical parallels of Cahoba. Um, this is probably one of the key things that is missing in understanding uh, the overall the Italian worldview. Um, now, me and Renee, we spoke a lot on many historical aspects and concerns to the Italian hierarchy, and this is one part that uh, we have not spoken about. Um, I think the best example when it comes to trying to understand what Cahoba was is reading uh, Jose R. Oliver's book, Caciques and Semi-Idols. Now, from Caciques and Semi-Idols, what Jose R. Oliver was saying that um, the Cahoba was the key institution of governing um, in making decisions. And with the removal of the Cahoba, um, the understanding of Semiism was lost. So um, by saying that, um, Renee, uh, what's your take uh, when it comes to uh, the Cahoba? Um, Cahoba is a, it's a very interesting plant. It's one of those plants that are um, that's interesting that is native to South America and the Caribbean. Um, it's, it's a very interesting plant. I heard it's, it's in, the intake is different than ayahuasca than any other plant because the other ayahuascas, uh, other um, Psychedelics you have to take early. This one you have to take through the nose. You have to snuff it. Uh, the cahoba was uh, very uh, popular amongst the Tainos and is actually also popular in South America. They call it yopo. Uh, the yopos is a very powerful uh, specific uh, seed. Actually, in Puerto Rico, we call cahoba for the wood. We say cahoba, but it's mentioned as a like for furniture, as a table. And the cajobana is, is the seed, or cajobana is actually the seed of that thing. So cajoba is a very, very strong wood in Puerto Rico. We use that term still, it's still that, that tiny term. Uh, but you can, if you read the chronicles, the, the, the recording, it was actually, uh, I have not found, I think we were talking about this, any recordings of cajoba in Las Casas work, but I found it in Panay's work. Maybe Las Casas did. I do have a book on it. It's about this big uh, of Las Casas, but I didn't really feel like looking into it because it's too much to go in there. So I found a different book, but on uh, this one, it's very smaller and it's only found by Penny. And you can see if you read Penny's account, you can see that they didn't really understood uh, the effects of Cohoba. They actually thought it was maybe some type of 
devil worship, of maybe some type of possession because of the vision that they saw, what the natives would go to, and the language that they would speak. They thought they were speaking and, you know, going through these phases, though it was some type of devil worshiping. Considering that the, the conquistadors or these the Europeans were um, Christianity, and if you notice by Christianity, anything that's not due to the same practices is dumb, they considered it as a heretic or witchcraft or sorcery. But uh, but that is my take on it, and um, um, I can read. Actually, I have a passage here by Penny okay. that uh, actually talks about it, and you can see in the passage of Penny how he misinterprets of uh, the whole effect on, of Cahoba. And I'll read it now, and uh, and you'll see. Um, he actually says here, and this is a book, and I think everyone should actually look into it. Um, this is actually a great book by. Um, he died. His name is uh, Neil L. Whitehead. He wrote the book, as we both have, the uh, Wild Majesty book with Kai Nagels. It's called um, Of Cannibals and Kings. It's a very small book, but it's a very good book because Neil Whitehead was very good um, ethnographer. But anyway, this is what he says of Panay's account. He actually says that, um, uh, let me see if I find it. Uh, okay, he says, and the man goes, this is a man going to a doctor, okay, of the Bahuti. And he says, I am, he says, he replies, I am Bahuti, uh, Bahutihu, as he's, as Pane recorded. And he tells you who I am. This is them going to a tree. This is the story of someone walking along, and he says, he sees some tree which moves as the roots. And the man stops with great fear, and he asks him who he is. So he goes to a tree. And he speaks to the trees. Okay, this is what they used to do, the Indians. And he actually tells him what he says um, what, to the trees. Um, he goes, someone is walking along and it says that he sees some tree and he moves at the roots. And the man stops with great fear and he asks him who he is. And he replies, I am Bohi and he tells you, and he and this tells you who I am. And the man goes to the aforesaid doctor and he tells him what he saw. And the sorcerer or the witch doctor rushes to see the tree which the other told him. And he sits next to it and he does cahoba to it. As we said before in the tale of the four brothers. Having done the cahoba, he stands up and he calls to it with honorific, honorific, like to the mighty Lord. As you can see, Pane is talking about the mighty Lord because he's coming for a Christian point of view. And he asks it, tell me who you are and what are you doing here and what you want from me. And what you sent for me. Tell me what you want. I mean, tell me what you want me. Tell me if you want me to cut you or if you want to come with me. How do you want me to carry you? And I will build you a house with possessions. With possessions. So that the tree or the simichi made idol or devil, as Pene calls it, answers, telling him the form in which he wants to be made. Which the tree tells him. Please. He builds his house with his with its garden, and many times a year he does kahoba. He, he does him kahoba. And said kahoba, said kahoba is to give him prayers. That's what kahoba is supposed to do, apparently, to the Indians. Or to please him and to ask him good or bad things, and also to ask him for wealth. And when they want to know if they will win a victory against the enemies, they go into a house in which only the most important men will go. And their Lord is the first to do the whole And please, I don't know how to pronounce this. This word in the name of the And while he does the kahoba, none of those who are in the gathering make judgment until the Lord is done. But as he ends his prayer, he stays for a quite long time with his head hung down and arms lying over his knees. Then he raises his head and he looks towards the sky and speaks. Then all reply in turn in a loud voice and after after they all have spoken they'll give thanks and he narrates and he narrates the vision he had and drunk with kahoba which he have taken with the semi they would win a victory or the enemies will flee or there will uh, be many casualties of war or famine or similar things along with what comes into mind who's drunk consider the state of his brain therefore they say that they think that they see the houses turning upside down and the men walking with their feet turned towards the sky. And this kahoba they use for the stone and wood and simi as with the dead bodies 
as we said earlier. So they do cahoba to the dead body, they do cahoba to the trees, whatever they want to speak to. So these are these psychedelics are like vision. You know, these are things that you cannot see in the naked eye. These are things you can see in the conscious mind. You can see in your cahoba, which is your subconscious. You know? So it's another realm to contact things in a different uh, in a different view, in a spiritual uh, there is a story in South America when uh, uh, a group of people go to, i give you an example, who goes to a, a, a shaman and they say that they have a sickness. His wife is pregnant, of course, the husband has a neck. So the, the, hus- the, the priest, the shaman, takes ayahuasca and he does a, uh, a ritual with maracas, of course. And his course is pitch black. It's the only time you're going to do the whole about any type of thing. Has to the next day, the shaman would draw of what he saw. And he told the women that she would have a boy. And when he went to the husband, he wrote what he saw in the husband. And he told the husband that he has spinal cord problem and he has in, um, parasites in his stomach. So it turns out when they go back into the States, remember they were they came to South America. When he went back into the States, it actually turns out the woman did have a boy. And the man did have parasites and he has spinal cord problems. So this is very interesting that these things give them visions, you know. These are stuff that they can communicate with nature, you know. To them, God deities with nature to them. As you can see in the tale, they would speak to the trees. Tell the trees how they want to be carved. This is why you see semi, you know what I mean? Different uh, images and different, um, um, the way they look, the, the, the characteristics, the big ears, you see, um, uh, what's his name? The guy with the, the teeth. You see the harp. Oh, yeah, that's my take of the whole. Yeah, that's a good take. Um, we can see through this how um, the Spanish saw many of these sacred practices as hearsay. And it makes sense how they associated with uh, uh, a concept of a devil. Because uh, these are things that, these are cultural practices, I would say more correctly, that did not register to them because it did not fit their philosophy. You know, like for example, um, when Las Casas would describe a, a native speaking while in Cohoba, um, he would say that, oh, that they're speaking uh, many, many senseless things. And Bonnet had described something even, even similar. He would, he would, he would uh, actually even say they're ignorant. He called them ignorance. Yeah. He would say people who are ignorant, he calls them like, you know, very uh, people who don't, who don't uh, practice the same faith as him. So he would call them ignorant. So as you can see, he would call them devil worshippers or sorcerers or witchcrafts. Which are wrong terminologies for these people, shamans. You know, shamans are not are not witchcraft. You know, there are there are spiritual people who contact with the gods, and um, you know, these are people who can guide you through the darkness. I think that's what we have said this many times. Right, right. What a shamanism is is a person who guides you through a darkness, who guides you through the journey, who heals you spiritually but not physically. That's the way he he's a physician. He's not a physician physically. He's a physician spiritually. You know what I mean? He cures you, um, your spiritual illness. You know, he tries to find, he tries to help you, guide you to find yourself. That is what the job of a shaman is, you know. Um, and that's not a witchcraft. That's not a witch doctor. Um, you can actually, you know, these are people who contact with these, with these deities, you know. Yeah, and it's interesting that we, we can see, like, an obvious example, we explained this many times, like in Embrace of the Serpent, uh, the influence of the missionaries on the natives, you know, because mm-hmm. um, as they became more influential, you know, they had imposed prohibitions on the natives or our ancestors from uh, conducting their cultural practices. And this we can say in one manner that uh, languages uh, phased out or became gentrified as uh, the natives were converted. I agree. That is very, very true. Um, well, you mean the missionaries. Yeah, if you read, um, 
I would suggest everyone to read Luisa Lu, Luis, Luisa Figueroa's book, and it's called History of Puerto Rico. Um, uh, she even states that the priests, I mean, well, the, the missionaries, what they when when they were baptized, um, the, the Indians, she they would call them even pardos, as a, I mean, the ethnic, the colors of these people, the ethnic race, they were also considered pardos and negros or colors, and some of them are even white. Um, she would they would label them of that of such and these were some of them came out to be um native color they will take out the indio and just categorize them as a color or part of those which means brown some of them if you was to marry a white they, you will consider a white person because you're marrying to the white you're to the white race but what's interesting is that then the, when they were doing the celsus or they were counting um the population of the Latin, they will only count the people that were being baptized and the churches. So this is how they would keep count. This is how they would um, keep count how many Indians survived. Because they only count the ones that were converting into Christianity and the ones that were being married. They never counted the ones that escaped into the mountains. And this is where the discrepancy comes in of how many Indians lived in the islands. You know, um, but La Rota Figueroa actually states this she have evidence to justice. Uh, the, the friars or the priests, kind of, they had this way of brainwashing the natives in a way into their um into their doctrine so they had to have been indoctrinated you know um look for example panay's friend um i think i forgot his name because panay wasn't a taino speaker he was a macro speaker so he there was a guy he was very friendly with uh in espanol his name is guatuava he actually is considered a saint in europe by the catholic church he's actually probably the first indigenous saint and he's actually recognized by the catholic church he was uh, you know, um, converted to Christianity, and um, he helped Pane uh, perhaps interpret a certain a tiny words, even the myths. And people don't know, but that is that is the theory, and I believe that is uh, a fact. In my, in my opinion, I think that's what he needed help because he wasn't a tiny speaker. Who else could help him? You know, and there was a competition between him and Las Casas at one point. You know, at one point they didn't like each other, so. Uh, um, a good example of, of, of uh, his friend dying, he witnessed his friend dying being burned, um, Watava, and the natives killed him, and they burned him to death. And the, one of his last words was a prayer. He said to them, to, to, this, to whatever he was uh, praying to, uh, adios. And you can see you have the Taino word and you have the Spanish uh, terminology. You see? So that's, that was his last words before he died. And that was Panay's friend. They were good friends. You know, I mean, you can see this is a great example in Embrace of the Serpent movie, right? Right, Remember? right. When, when they went back into the uh, to the place, you saw the little kids cutting their hairs and they were dressing in these um, drogues and Jesus and being whipped, you know, trying to get the same pain as Jesus. Right, right. You know, worshiping. The, very interesting. It was very, very interesting. You know, how instead of breaking the physically as abusing to break them down mentally and this is the key of how the europeans did into the modern day even to us I and mean, we can see it as a modern day people instead of breaking them down physically and chaining them up and abusing them they break them down mentally if you can break them down mentally you can you can get them you can control them this is what they did to the natives too you know and try to kill them. Hey, why not just brainwash them? Why not just mentally break them, indoctrinate them, tell them that, you know, do this, this person won't give you this. You know what I mean? Um, and that was probably one of the key roles. The same way as the Africans, they, they did the same thing with the Africans. You know, so it was a mental enslavement uh, um, that they done after. They did so, the um, I think there's a lot that um, the people don't understand and one of it is concerning uh, hallucinogens. Um, during the time of like the contact period, you know, the hallucinogens such as the cohoba uh, is something that became taboo um, because at the time it didn't fit um, the agenda of, of the Spanish. And you see today in the present that uh, hallucinogens became forbidden. You know, it's like saying um that it's devil worship so you know i just wanted to see what's your take on that you know maybe 
um, you can oh. shed some light on it. Oh yeah, of course. Um, well, hallucinations uh, are, um, um, you know, to the to the Catholicism and Christianity. If you didn't, if if you weren't practiced, if you weren't the same religion as them, they would bash you, and you were devils and everything else, you know. But the these plants were very sacred to the natives, and um, you know, um, the truth of the matter is, is that people fear what they don't understand. So um, these plants uh, were very sacred because they, when you take these plants, um, it would do something to you spiritually. You know, you become a very sp a spiritual person after you take these plants. And these plants are, are there's a reason why they were planted on this earth. And I remember uh, hearing a native uh, Indian uh, in a documentary I was watching, he said these plants were created by the creator because, well, planted by the creator, because it, it was the way to contact them. So in a way, these plants were like the cell phones to the spiritual world, you know? And, um, you know, it's interesting because every culture has done some type of uh, hallucinogenic, used some type of hallucinogenic plant, you know? You have the Hindus, they've used um, the lotus, right? The Egyptians too, the lotus. This is why you see them in the, in the hieroglyph, is the Egyptians smelling the lotus plant. You have in the Hindus, Lotus. This is why in the chakras you have the lotus open up in, this, in, the, in the chakra crown, and you see Krishna coming out the lotus flower. And then you have the Mayans, and you have um, there's possibly the Mayans have took the lotus flower, but that's a different that's a different um, story. Then you have the Tainos who took the the Cahoba. Then you have the the South American tribes who took ayahuasca in Yopo, which is the same as Cahoba. So it's and in Europe too they took it. They used the mushroom. So it's it's very it's very interesting to me that they ban these specific plants that uh, a lot of coaches have used for thousands of years. You know, there's a reason why they took this for thousands of years. And to the natives, they didn't re they were very strict to who they shared this type of medicine with. You know, a great example is in the movie Embrace of the Serpent. You remember the scene when the German guy came and he was sick, and the guy didn't. <laughs> it wasn't easy for him to share him the plant, you know, because he wasn't ready for it. You see, he had to go through a fast. He had to test him as a man, as a human being, how, how he can hold with fasting. Um, he had to go through this type of initiation, you know, steps before he could take this plant. So, you know, these plants are, are very sacred. And it's interesting because when you speak about these plants for other individuals, they believe, oh, why are you taking that drug? Why is this a drug? And they don't understand the difference between drugs and earth uh, or medicine. These are not drugs. To me, these are medicines. And just like you go to a pharmaceutical uh, companies, even the word pharmacy is a Greek word. I, I, don't, I forgot the pronunciation of the Greek word pharmacello, but it means sorcery. So in a way, your corner pharmacy is it's a sorcerer. Those are people who does um, and things to these drugs that you have to take every day. And those are the things that are not good for you. They mess up your body every day. Now, we, a plant who has not done any damage to not in my understanding any damage health wise to any individual with these sacred plants you know it actually benefited them spiritually mentally and physically you know so um that's just my opinion on these plants yeah i think there's something to point out also um is that since uh the days of the conquest uh with the fall of the social and political structure we can see in the present, maybe perhaps there was a concern of people um, misusing those sacraments because as we saw in Edward's of the Serpent, um, there had to be a strict probation uh, observed. Otherwise, it can be uh, uh, very threatening for, uh, for the, the pupil who could be a potential initiate. I agree. What was interesting when the initiate do take this medicine, one of the symptoms is they would, um, they would just purging, sweating, and it's a very rough um, a journey. And the purging is just symbolic. It's just meaning that, you know, you're purging all that bad energy, you know. And the journey is not an easy journey either. You know, it's a very tough journey. It helps individuals spiritually. Um, I have not read any chronicles from the Caribbean take any of this stuff. I don't know. Maybe they have, but 
they just never wrote it down. I don't know in South America any um, people who traveled there um, from other parts of the world from from the, like in their chronicles ever took it hasn't been written. I don't know, but um, it's you see th- these plants or these hallucinogenics are still not well understood yet, and scientists are still trying to understand it yet. So no one knows because it's it's. It's not really well explained. I know they're starting to use it now for certain people as a therapy now, you know. But there's a reason why they, they legalize it, because it, it benefits, you know, just like marijuana benefits other people. But, um, you know, that's just one of the things they're starting to do now, the scientists. they actually using it to treat people who have, like, post-traumatic stress, other types of things, and it, it helps them spiritually. It's now because it's not well understood um, yet. We're gonna get into um, the subject about the, the symbolism of the serpent. Um, when it comes to this Taino worldview, I think this is an important piece that people are overlooking, and to be able to understand what our um, Taino ancestors in the Antilles saw the world, one of the most important things to be able to get. A grasp in how they view their society, in my opinion, is the symbolism of the serpent. What's your take on it? Um, the symbolism of the serpent uh, has been uh, a symbol in all ancient cultures. Um, you see this in the Bible when Adam and Eve eating from the the tree and the serpent um, tempting her to eat from the tree of knowledge. Uh, and you see this and uh, the Mayans of Kuku Khan. You see this. The Quoto, you see this, and um, the Babylonians, he's called as Owens. Um, most of it, uh, the serpent is also the symbol of wisdom and knowledge because he is depicted as the spine of the human of the human of the human body. But he's also the energy that's um, that is the force of the spine, which is Kudalini. And um, most of uh, uh, the Kudalini is a, is a specific energy that comes from the bottom of the spinal cord that raises up to the to the, the cranium, or to the to, all the way to the pineal gland, that uh, that enforces a, a a sense of of a trance of enlightenment, and people who go to sit in trance, they usually see specific geom- geometric shapes, um, they see colors, they see uh, beings, they be in contact with beings, and also they see serpents. So the serpent has been a um, also is also been a symbol of a rebirth. And it has also been symbol of uh, a lot of things. Um, uh, I think we both know this in South America. Uh, even in the movie Embrace of the Serpent, the guy said that the boa came from the sky. Mm. And, and the specific what he was referring to is the Milky Way. Because the Milky Way is also referred as a serpent. But it's referred as a serpent as eating its own tail. So this is an occult symbol. Most of it is... Um, they have this um, a symbol with the snake eating his own tail with a, a six or five point star. So that is the Milky Way. You know, um, it also has to do with consciousness in the, the serpent. Uh, the serpent is a, is a, a symbolic because uh, it makes sense that it has to do with the spinal cord and it has to do with this, the uh, the chakras because there's there there are about more than seven chakras, but mainly there's seven. And since the serpent also comes from the word septenary, which means seven, uh, these are the seven main chakras. Uh, seven main chakras correspond to the seven planets, and also uh, the human the human being of um, of the human body is also made of the twelve zodiac signs, you know. And um, the thirteenth, which is the most enlightenment, is Ophiuchus, who is the, the bear serpent. So he has to do with the consciousness of man, and he is the rising of that Kudalini energy, you know. So, but yeah, that's my take on it. Yeah, I see what you're saying. You know, the thing with conscious with the serpent, I agree that it has to do with consciousness, which it has to do mm-hmm. with the mind. It has to also do with the free will of the individual. Exactly. What I find also deep about the serpent that it also has to do with interfacing with experience like for example uh with the church the symbolism of the serpent has be became something that has been taboo 
such as the story with the serpent tempting Eve. Uh, Eve, in my opinion, she represents the consciousness of the individual. And the serpent, in my opinion, will represent free will or exactly. a, a state of consciousness or a state of mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like in, in Egypt, um, um, you see this in Egypt and it's symbolic of... Um, of their the um, the masks, and they would usually have two two animals. They would have the eagle on the on the right side, and sometimes the um, the, the cobra or the serpent. And he is referred as the Uraeus or Uraeus, or he's very similar to Jesus. Or that is that was their uh, Egyptian messiah, Uraeus or Uraeus, like Jesus or Jesus, you know. But um, the reason they would have these these animals on the um, the symbolic animals on those specific uh, deals or uh, effigies is because the eagle it represents the right brain, and the serpent represents the left brain, because of the the right brain or the eagle is a symbolic of the sun. Because when you awake in the mornings, you're conscious, and eagles they uh, they hunt in the morning, you know. So when you sleep. Um, the moon is out, so the serpent represents the subconsciousness, because when you're sleeping, you're subconscious. You're using your left brain. So in a way, in a way, it's it's you you have to use both brains in order to reach that high consciousness. So you will see this that the eagle, oh I mean sorry, the serpent, also has to do with the pineal gland. Uh, it's the Kundalini energy. Even in the Bible, you see this in Abel, uh, Cain and Abel. You know. Uh, Cain and Abel, Cain killing his brother Abel because it represents the two hemispheres of the brain because Abel represents the um, cerebel or Abel. Um, it represents the unbalance of the brain. So if people can understand, uh, if they can control that Kodalini energy or that septenary or s s serpent energy, they can reach a higher consciousness by, higher consciousness by um, operating both hemispheres of the brain. You know, and... That's exactly what it is, you know. And this is what the the shamans in South America knew because they knew when you take ayahuasca's, uh, that will it actually makes you operate a, both sides of the hemispheres of the brain. You know, your brain operates a lot. It it, it amplifies a lot of neurons and gives you these. Um, um, you operate a hundred, almost not a hundred percent of your brain, but your brain works as mu uh, twice as much as normal. You know, it gives these um, these chemical reactions, and you see it's like a window, man. You go into another realm, you know, and that's what exactly represent. That's what this energy is. Yeah, I think closing out, um, what I would say that the serpent has to do uh, with realization. Um, discovering one's potential. Um, it can also represent um, a spirit or your inner will guiding you to um, discover what calling truly is. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, the 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 serpent is not in the Bible. The rest, there's a reason why they have it as an evil is the evil type of culture, right? It's the reason why they say don't listen to it because Eve represents, she wanted all the knowledge. So she left, um, she left that specific uh, area to go and seek knowledge. Because once you seek knowledge, you can never go back. So you, you cast from that area, you know. And that's what she represents, you know. It's, it's um, there's both tree of knowledge. You got the tree of the tree of uh, the tree of what is it? Tree of life, tree of, tree of knowledge, and they both are the same. They both in the same tree. I mean, they both from the same tree. You know, it's it's um, it just represents consciousness. You know, but that is the serpent. The serpent is is actually there was one time all cultures represent ser serpents. You see this in every culture. You see this in Taino culture, um, possibly in Taino culture. The belt might be um, a serpent. You know. Um, you see this in Mayans, a Kuku Khan. You see this in Kwati Kwoto. And you, if you see images of Kwati Kwoto, you see him, uh, even Kuku Khan. He's a serpent. He's a guy, um, you see this, um, a guy who comes out of the water. Or um, sometimes it, it could be a fish type of serpent, but he specifically is a serpent.
we're seeing coming out of the water, he teaches people astronomy and mathematics and, and, and astrology and all types of wisdom. And in a story, he tells them, listen, I will be back. I come back. And he leaves. And when the conquistadors came, um, they actually thought that he was, they were the descendants of Quatiquoto. The reason was because Quatiquoto had a cross on his neck. And when the Europeans came, they came with crosses, so it looked very familiar to them. And uh, it was a reason why they kind of bowed to them and thought they were these, you know, they thought they were descendants of Quatiquoto. Even in Babylonia, you have Onis or Dogon, who was a serpent like fish, comes out of the ocean, teaches the people there mathematics and all that. So the, the serpent represents wisdom, it always has. You know, um, in India they have the uh, Krishna. Krishna is coming out of a fish's mouth. It's either a fish or a serpent because the fish is also has to do with the uh, with wisdom too, but it's usually the serpent. You know, it's the serpent or the fish, but it's either one. But you see Krishna with snakes, right? You do see him, right? Like a cobra. You know, you do see Krishna with a snake. Right. You know, and you. See see uh, Shiva in Brahma, you know, you see them. So it represents that wisdom, consciousness. You know? oh, right. So it's, it, it's, it's, it's very interesting, you know, just to say the least, it's very, very interesting that all cultures actually knew that there was this serpent has to do with some type of uh, a hidden wisdom or something like that. Yeah, I think we can agree to say that um, with the, the event of the conquest, um, through the influence of the church, um, these things they, they became taboo. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, yep. Exactly. Yeah. Um, about the Wabonito and uh, um, the and Wayahona, it's a very interesting story because uh, Wabonito uh, linguistically is uh, um, not really a Arawak, um, an Arawakan word. Uh, According to the research I've been doing, I have not traced any word that's uh, has a um, very related to the word Wabonito. Um, but what was very interesting about the name Wabonito is, um, you know, uh, Pane, who is uh, a Catalan descent. Uh, when he came into the Dominican, when he came in as a, a missionary, he wasn't affluent in um, a, um, Taino language. He was more of a speaker of Makuri, you know. And I think we both know this. And um, he had a helper. Uh, I think his name was um, Watwaba, something like that. But I, I forgot his name. He was an Taino uh, Indian from uh, from the Caribbean. Uh, I mean, from there, from DR. Um, he is actually known to the um, to the uh, to the Catholics, to the Vatican, as the first uh, indigenous uh, saint. Actually, he's very known in. in, in um, in, in Europe, as an indigenous saint, because he he was uh, a, a a Christian. He became a Christian. He died, and he was a good friend of Pani. They were very good friends, and he died. The Indian, his own natives killed him, and uh, the last words that he said, when his death was, um, well, they burned him, was uh, "Nabor Nabor adios." You know, that was the last words they ever um, heard from him when he was burning, according to Pani. But anyways. Uh, Pane, who was a Catalan born, recorded the story of uh, Wayahona and, 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 and Wabonito. But what's interesting about Wabonito is, um, to the Catalans, the word Bonito is perhaps a Spanish name. It's uh, because remember, the the Spaniards didn't understand how the Indians spoke, and phonetically it was very, uh, um, very different the way they spoke for them. Um, even with tone wise. So the Spanish used the tongue and the natives would use the nose or the throat. So they couldn't really pronounce certain um, certain words or the ways the, the Indians spoke. So bonito is actually a Spanish word that means little fishes. And uh, the reason these, it's, it's very interesting about it because they would say, I bonito because they're little tiny fishes, they're very cute fishes. So I believe when Pane, um, may have heard the, the story of, of, of Wai Bonito and Wayahona and telling him about that this uh, water spirit who came from the water may have been like a fish, 
you know what I mean? And the only thing he would uh, say was bonito, wow, bonito, you know? And um, we both know that her story is very similar to the South American tale of Orihu and um, and stuff. But now, Wayahona, um, his name um, is probably um, uh, related to what Panay states in his book of, um, uh, I forgot the name of the book, Anti uh, Antiquities. Antiquities of Indians. Yeah, the Indies. Uh, he states in that book that Wayahona's name is related to the Arawak word wa Wadi, Wadiha, something like Wahadiha? that. Wahadiha? Yeah. Wahadiha, yeah. Which means henceforth. It's henceforth because it means uh, a name that has to be changed. Which makes sense to me because uh, Wayahona was a the first person who was initiated into a shamanistic mystery system, or I would say uh, seminism or semi Mystery, a mystery system, a practice of semis. Um, and Juan Bonito be, be, who became his um, initiator. Um, the, the story goes that he saved this woman and from the water who was a serpent-like, because usually those tales are like serpent or a, a fish. But she was a water spirit. And she uh, gave him pleasure and taught him these semis, the semi-mystery uh, systems. And um, she uh, changed his name. You know, we both know when you go into initiations, you have to change a name. This is common amongst every culture. You become uh, a reborn. You know what I'm saying to you? So every mystery system, you always, when you be initiated, you always obtain a new name. Especially when you're sick. Now, when you look at Wanyahona, he was sick. He had uh, a skin condition. And usually this is very common in South America because in South America when the little kids would get sick and the shaman would cure them, they would change their name, you know, to a new, uh, as a, like a, they became a new person, you know. So that makes sense to me that he became, I think his name was Wa'al Boboel, something like that. Wanin, right? What was his name? Ape Borael. Yeah. 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 See, see, that name is very interesting, the L part. The L part has to be a Spanish influence in my opinion, because it's that word, El, is not common amongst any Aguacan based language. But what's interesting, now this is just a theory, is that the Spaniards, we both know, has encountered even the Bay words, right? Has encountered Moors from Spaniard, from Spain. And some of the Spaniards were Moors as well. And usually Moors always um, use the word Bay Right? They use this word bay all the time. So it's very common amongst them, especially amongst the Spaniards. So that's one theory. We don't know that, but that's just theory. That's it. Um, but Yel is, in fact, a probably Jewish or even Spaniard because El means a father or soul, spirit, whatever it is. So Albo El. But usually the El is very, um, is, the, is the original word for Li, is the same word as the Li. Because the Lee I can understand as being Arawak, because the Lee means man or something like that, or he, you know what I mean, man or he or me, you know. So Lee is more uh, practical in my in, in my opinion, as like Al Babali or something like that, you know. But the L part is not in fact um, at all an indigenous word, you know. Yeah, it's just in my opinion, just uh, going back to Wabonito real quick. Um, the Wa is out of walking for us, our, but Bonito, it does sound very Spanish, in my opinion, as well. Yes, I agree, yeah. I agree, yeah. The Wa, Wa Bonito story is a very interesting story, you know, because you see um, how you see, like, a similarities. If you if people were to pay attention to the story of South America, of Orehu and Arawanidi story, which I think we spoke about this already, people will understand the story of Wabonito and uh, Wayahona because there is this, this story is always, has always been very common amongst all cultures of a man who becomes initiated and becomes some sort of, after becomes initiation, changes his name and becomes some type of a messiah or a savior, you know? Look at the Karinago, right? The Karinago have the same, is have the story of Wayahona and they tell. His name is what, Hiona or Hiali? Right, that's correct. Right, he becomes the Caribbean. He becomes the found. Yeah, he becomes the foundation of the Caribbean nation. 
So every tale has the same exact um, mythology, but they use different names, you know. And you can see this amongst even. What's interesting about Wanyahona story is that when you go to South America, and you ask them what is the story of Arawanili story, right? They would tell you that it actually derived from the Caribbean, from an island in the north. They would tell you this. That story derived from the island. What island? The only island that I know, even archaeologists usually, um, they think this too, is Trinidad. And Trinidad is in the Caribbean. It could be Trinidad or any island in the north. No one knows. But the only island that I believe is Trinidad. You know what's interesting that you mentioned that? Uh, a similar story with the Warao um, that is similar to the Wahayona story. The emphasis on Trinidad yes. being similar to Martini No. Yeah, that's I, I, that's that's a fact. Yeah, they actually I remember Jorge Jorge Estevez George uh, said that there is proof in fact that DNA in Dominican Republic of people what are um, descent. So that's one thing that that kinds of um, debunk not debunks but that the natives not only hopped, they went across. So in a sense, they didn't went up to Trinidad all the way up. They went from the South America across from the Caribbean. So it's possible as that as well, you know. Um, but there is, uh, if people understand the Wayahona and the Wabonito story, you will understand um, how it's possibly that that can be the foundation of all the mythologies of the Taino uh, myths. The Yaya, the that can be the whole foundation there, you know, that can be where it all started because he is the man who comes to a journey and who becomes the foundation of the Caribbean nation. He becomes some sort of like a messiah, you know, but most of it is when you, the, the, the problem is the Pane kind of didn't really finish it and his, his, his story is a little uh, complex, you know, and considering that he wasn't a Taino speaker fluently, and he didn't record really the mythology really precise. So it's very difficult to understand the way he writes, you know. It's not really easy. And it gets very frustrating at the same time. Yeah, in, in my opinion, uh, it's the writing style of, of that document that makes the narratives appear very obscure. So if the reader yeah. is not familiar with similar accounts, it's going to be very difficult for them to picture in their mind what the story represents. So I, I, I think yeah, you make good points here. Yeah, I think so too. And this is what, um, uh, like I said, that's the most interesting thing is that um, I've, my re it's my research and you know you did, you've you been doing uh, extensive amount of research yourself and you see that you can see the, the similarities between other coaches who have some sort of, a, of an individual who becomes initiated into some type of um, some system. And and most common is is that he changes his name. You know, you can even look into the biblicals. You can look into the Egyptians. You can look into any type of culture. It's always the same. It's always a man who becomes uh, some sort of a, a messiah. A great example, if you look at Jesus, he's getting baptized by John the Baptist, and he becomes right. So the same as Wayahona, he gets some in the water, right? Gets initiated to this water spirit. He becomes, right? You see um, stories of people from Babylonians. You see stories. I mean, so you could, I mean, I can go on and on, but it's just very, it's very interesting that um, that this this type of story is very common amongst cultures. You know? That's just this. That's the most fascinating. Part. On the um, meaning like on the matriarchal and uh, the feminine aspect. Um, what I what I've noticed in a lot of these groups is that they're following a patriarchal society, which is, uh, which is kind of weird because the Indians they follow they came from um, a matriarchal society. Um, if you if you read the, if you read history and you follow the way the the Indians used to be, you know maybe. Before the Europeans came in, they actually derived from a matriarchal society. And what I mean is, is that not that the way their structure work was, the structure was in their uh, and they culture it. 
it wasn't how it is now where you see that a lot of this mojismo and this uh, patriarchal kind of uh, uh, he-man and always a dominant over dominant towards women the the ancients the way they did it was it wasn't about masculine it was over feminine it was a balance you see because we is there's in everything in nature there's always a polarity you know what i mean everything needs everything in the universe is created that's just the, the law of the the principle of the the universe works you know you need that masculine and feminine aspect and it's not that the masculine is better than the feminine they need each other it's a balance you know um the ancients they practiced that they knew that if they respected the women you know what i mean they respected them and the women respected the men it was a balance it was not how it is now that patriarchal society is a european concept that's that's an idea to it because they come from that roman or uh, the roman um type of uh, um, idea but um, the indians even in the egyptians um right now that they're finally realized that it was never male pharaohs you know because why because who's who's the one that's um writing the uh the egypt history right now Europeans, you know what I mean? Greeks, they didn't understand the way the Egyptian culture was. Now they're starting to realize that the most of the Egyptians were they were only women pharaohs, which which is very true. The last pharaoh was Cleopatra. So if you see in every culture and every every culture came from a matriarchal society, because the women were the teachers. I mean, you see this you see this today in, in um, you know look in modern day world. You know when the woman gets when the baby is born, who is it close by? Who nurtures the baby? The mother you know she's it's there's a bond between the mother and the baby you know so the mother was always the one that was nurturing the baby you know always around the baby so when the carrots will give you an example uh with, I, won't, I won't say cows because they don't go about carbs and they never worked they never did that's another european concept the kalinagos for example um the the french the way they record in the account although they went to islands and kidnapped women okay yes that's true but that didn't change the way they respected the women. They always respected the women. Always, you know. Um, this was recorded in the account in the book of um, Wild Majesty. I think you know this because we both read it. And that account there, it says that the men respected the women. They never treated them bad. They understood their roles. They understood, you know, each other's places. It was a bond. It was a balance. That's exactly what it is, you know. And um, when... You see this, and you know this whole thing with patriarchal thing. This is a European concept. I see this today all the time, especially in this Taino kind of, you know, certain groups, you know. But yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Um, I was just reading this not too long ago. This is from the Central Arawaks. I think you're gonna like this. Um, this is on page mm -hmm. 95, right? It says, um, the first wife is the master of the household, and usually does less of the outdoor work. She assumes the care of both sets of children and governs the household so successfully that they grow up as one family. Now, that was really interesting, interesting to me because that made, that made me thought about the word cacique. Yeah. Because in the Locono, they have the same word um, indicating both the male and the female as a household. That's interesting. That's very interesting right there, you know, and you, you can see, you know, they come from a march society you know even in the story of Wayohona, right and why bonito i mean you can see this you know who was who's the one that taught Wayohona the medicine who initiated him to the shamanism the shamanism mystery system wow well, uh, well, and the story you see this the women she told him this you know and um women are just naturally uh healing spiritually beings you know what i mean they have a, a magnet you know a magnetism um uh aura to them you know as in men has an electric uh kind of aura to them but they have this healing aspect so she told him this she told him this uh this this the shamanism um system you know and you see this he became as the kainago uh mythology they, they he's actually his name in the kainago uh, mythology is hiali right i mean pane has him as a hiali and in the mythology they call him this person in yali he became the foundation of the caribbean nation afterwards so, you know so he he passed down that teachings and um and you know 
And this is the thing. I mean, you can see this in other South American. You can see the same story in South America, right? You have the story of uh, the same exact story. Um, Arwanili and Noriu. You know, Arwanili became it's the same story as the Wayahona. Arwanili was taught by a woman or a water spirit, as as they call it, a female water spirit or a water serpent. It's a serpent um, being. Her name is Oreyu, and Oreyu taught Arawanili these, you know, the shamanism mystery system. You know, she gave him specific rocks for the maracas, because the maracas were used today. Back in those times, the same thing, you know, when you're here in the salsa, those were used for the shamans to heal. You know, you could see this in any of the coaches, too. Yeah. But he became a healer. And what's a shaman? A shaman is a person that guides you through the darkness. You know what I mean? Because when you in these psychedelic type of plants, right, the shaman has to be there to guide you because when you go into a different type of, when you out there and you out there, they guide you because they have the eyes for that. They see in the dark. You know what I mean? They have the eyes. They can see. They're the ones that they guide you through the darkness. You know what I mean? And that's what she did to him. She guided him through the darkness and she healed him too because he was sick, right? I think he had some kind of like a, a skin disease or something like that, right? He had like a, yeah, yeah. I mean, people, scholars still don't know what type of a disease it was. They say it was an STD, maybe syphilis, you know. Um, we still don't even know what it is, but it could be syphilis. The only reason they say syphilis because um, when, the, when the mother is born, when a mother has syphilis and the baby is born, when she has a disease, uh, that baby may have some type of... Uh, uh, ab uh, abnormalities like skin, scaby skin, or hard, you know, kind of kind of deformed or something like that with the skin, you know. So you know, we still don't even know what this is. You know, it could be a lot. It could be a lot. It's, it could be symbolic. You yeah, know? I, I also agree that it could be symbolic only because so far from what I read from other accounts, instead of saying that um, explain the notion about syphilis. They say that the original disease comes from some sort of uh, sorcery or by from another shaman. Yeah, exactly. I think me and you was actually you actually said this because they were afraid to mention names, right? They weren't, you know, they thought that they were going to do some type of spell. Right. You know what I mean in the names. So yeah, that can be it too. That can be it too. Some type of uh, sorcery, you know. But to me, a shamanism is a sorcerer. And that's what is a shaman is. A shaman is is a different word. Is another was another word for them in their language, but we just call them shaman shaman today. And um, my brother uh, Ayala, I remember him saying that the word shaman comes from um, I think Siberia. I think what he told me if I if I remember, I have to ask him again. But yeah, the the sorcerers, those these people, these medicine people, they were they were very knowledgeable in medicine, and people don't know this, and they still have to understand this. They were also knowledgeable in astrology because they understood the stars. You know, the sky was their language, and that was period. You know, they follow the stars. You know, so not the shaman. It's hard to people people to believe this that you know, considering a Native Americans people, they understand they were astrologers. You know, uh, they just understood it in their different way, in their way. But they were very efficient astrologers. That's a good take, and I think we can stop right there, but it definitely shows that uh, through the dogma, um, a lot of these uh, misconceptions are slowly being uh, And one thing, too, I want to say is that this patriarchal thing is, it's they, if you, these people are still following, some people I see them, they're still following this concept. That's another thing that you just said, a, do, a dogmatic principle. That comes from a very Christian European mindset. You know what I mean? Because and when the Europeans came into the islands and they saw the, the natives respecting the women the way it was, they kind of thought that, wait a minute, what are you doing? You know, we more, we we over uh, dominate the women. You know what I mean? You don't, you don't need to, uh, you're weak. They called them weak. They thought they were weak because of that. Right. And, you know. And our women um, wanted them, them wanting to learn about their culture that kind of throws them off. So it doesn't really help them at all. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, exactly, yeah. Exactly.